Hey, Scott from Aristocob.com here. And Seth from a chickenpasture.com. Together, all of us, we are Markwood Men's Breakfast Club. And good morning, and good morning, boy. Good morning. We were going to talk about that last I week. I know. Well, maybe we'll talk about it this week. Yeah. So, good. we're going to continue our cigar in a cob um, experiment with what I thought would be the more practical use. And let me first explain was the reason why this had occurred to me years ago. I had a cigar humidor that I kind of forgot. Okay. I, I slid it up on top of a kitchen cabinet, and there it was, high near the ceiling where it's hotter and it wasn't getting humidified. And when I finally remembered that, oh dang it, I, I haven't up, I, I haven't added anything to the humidor. Yeah. Um, I I got it down and I added water to the completely dried out <laughs> humidifier, stuck it in there, and a week later it I opened fun, it up right? to see. Yeah. <laughs> I opened it up to see what condition everything was in, and every cigar was split. Uh, I mean, it looked terrible, and I knew nothing about really cigar care yeah. before that time. And what I learned from that experience is when a cigar gets totally dry, that's the beginning of the cracking. Mm. And it gets even worse when you then rehumidify it because the exterior is going to become overly humidified while the interior is trying so to take dry, on. Yeah. Take, yeah. And in the end, they, it ends up kind of falling apart. Yeah. At that moment, I thought, you know what? i got to either throw these away or smoke them in a pipe. Hey, I could smoke these in a pipe. Okay. So I, I crumbled one or two of them up into a bowl. I moistened a paper towel and laid it over the bowl, which is, by the way, how I rehumidify tobacco if I forget it in a Ziploc baggie somewhere. And uh, probably 10 minutes or so later, it was perfectly smokable. So here's what we're going to do. We, we have broken out the, uh, the tobacco grinder. And this has got teeth on both sides, and it's got a compartment below. I'm not sure how well this is going to work because I don't know that the cigar is going to crush it, into those small holes. Well, it never worked very well anyway using yeah. using normal tobacco. We, we bought bought that years ago for the um, cigar. Briar cigar. Briar cigar. Because uh, we heard that finer tobacco smoked better in it. Well, and then we find out that uh, actually that was mostly for flakes that it was right. called for. So I have part of the cigar from last week, and I have the, the butt end of that same cigar. I don't think I can put it all in here at once. Uh, I'd, I'd suspect that the best best way to do this, if you have a lot, if, if let's say you just have a dried out... It's dry, crumbled up. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, can you do it by hand? Or yeah, would you crumbled. do it in like a, like a food processor? It's dry. Right. So... I think you'll be just fine crumbling it up, and uh, so that's that's now totally that's, smokeable. Yeah, we need something to dump this into though, because I'm going to do the other half here. Uh, here we go. <laughs> okay, that got most of it. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. And then I think the advantage of of doing it this direction or this it's way, still, it's still very leafy. Yeah, almost looks like fish food. Here, some of it fell out in my hand. Still don't have this closed yet. This is, that's a big old piece of cigar I put in there. Well, you put the tail end of it too. Mm -hmm. so it's really tightly wrapped. But doing this method, I think, is going to introduce then the binder and the uh, wrapper ah. that we weren't getting in last week's smoke. So, so uh, maybe a better flavor? I think so. And for your needs, I think that you'll be able to pack this without it getting too... Oh yeah, it's very loose right now. Too dense. Do you have enough over there? I think so. I just have to get it out of the grinder. <laughs> wow. I am putting it back into that same pipe. Yeah, because we will then smoke this in a future episode and see, we'll put maybe some 1Q in it. This pipe? This pipe, yeah. and see if it, if it did ghost it. Right? Yep. I gotta get some more. I gotta get some tobacco loose from this thing. I wonder if it's if there's any in that next layer down. Well, I definitely like better. Certainly a little bit coming through. Certainly still has the qualities and flavor of a cigar over pipe tobacco. Man, this is just so fluffy. This the tobacco that made yeah. it through to the bottom really of the chamber. Crush it down. Wow. 
Uh, that's not like pipe tobacco <coughs> at all at this point. Oh, I got a big old whiff of something like burn burning. Tastes like burned. All right, here we go. Let's try it. It doesn't taste bad. I recommend this any day over over what we just did. Over jamming a cigar into the pipe. If you're gonna, if you're gonna right smoke, a, back, you're right. If you're gonna smoke a cigar, smoke a cigar. Well, again, if but in this case, I'm talking about the possibility I, of no. redeeming an otherwise unsmokable. Cigar. If you're going to, if your cigar is smokable, like the last one, smoke it as a yeah, cigar. As a cigar, I agree. If you if you have the option between pitching it or salvaging the tobacco, this is perfectly viable, I think. Yep. All right. And what you could do, if I mean, it's still, it's it's a bit, it is a, it's a bit bizarre smoking what is more clearly a cigar mm -hmm. flavor in a pipe. This doesn't really taste of pipe tobacco, mm -hmm. but I bet it would be great if you mixed it and blended it with... 1Q? With some 1Q, did some 50-50 or something. Then you really could be... Or um, Lane BCA. Yeah. Black Cavendish. Yeah, I, and I would say that's better because we are, in fact, getting that leaf. Yeah. We're getting the wrapper and the binder. Yeah. And I was able to pack Isn't it. Isn't that interesting? It's the exact same cigar. Yeah, and I was able to pack it properly, which um, I hopefully will not get that big old hit and get lightheaded from having to, to pull draw so hard on it. So what did we talk about this week? I, you know, I forget what we we, we said we were going to talk about something. What was it? Bruh. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's probably pretty good too. It's a great topic. We were going to talk about this, and we were going to talk about. I don't know. We can talk about the thing we were just talking about that I said that we won't talk about. Okay, it's fine. Uh, so I listen to a podcast. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts. One of them is called Story Brand podcast and um it's uh, written by an author that i i quite enjoy or not written the podcast is hosted by an author donald miller um he started a business where he helps uh do marketing consulting essentially and um so he interviews uh, a lot of really smart business people some of the, the the interviews they have are on leadership some of them are on hiring practices some of them are on uh, marketing, selling, um, it, it kind of is in the same vein as the Entree Leadership Podcast, um, uh, parts of uh, Smart Passive Income Podcast. There are any number of business podcasts out there that you can listen to. And they had a guest on today, and in just the 30-minute ride to work, um, there was so much valuable information that I immediately went out and got the book that she's written. She wrote last year, and she's written. Yeah, um, her name it was is Donald Miller. Was the was, oh he is the host of the he podcast. is the host of the podcast, and he was interviewing. Got it. Her name is Vanessa Van Larsen. Vanessa Van Edwards. Not even close. Vanessa Van Edwards. Um, Really, really interesting, her book, and, and some of the stuff that she talks about. We've talked before, I've talked before about some of the um, uh, some of the books and things that my company has used that uh, really dive into the psychology of how people work and how people interact. Um, Persuasion by Robert Cialdini is one. Uh, how to Win Friends and Influence People is one. We've gone to training courses. We... we, we really invest in this stuff and this I think falls very closely in line with a lot of those principles so it's research based um, but she has very practical recommendations in the book and so so far and I've, I've mostly just been skimming but so far some of the things that she's covered is um, I, oh and the, the book is called uh, the book is called I'll tell you in a minute uh, my goodness <laughs> talk about being prepared well captivating the book is called Captivating, and and she said, you know, she she says she was a self-proclaimed um, uh, wallflower basically, and um, wanted to figure out through science 
how to connect with people and become a more captivating person. And so some of the practical things that she talks about right out of the gate are uh, when you go to a boardroom, let's say, if you're going to have a, a work meeting, she says where to sit in the room to achieve different, different goals or, 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 or to fill certain roles. So she points out where the, the leader, the alpha in the, the room will typically sit naturally. Um, and it's typically, uh, in, in a, if you've got a rectangular table, they're typically sitting at the head of the table opposite the door. And she talks about how that goes back to, you know, primal days where we're, we're uh, worried about wanting to keep an eye on what's going on. Oh, yeah, watching out for threats and things. That's right. When I'm in a restaurant or any place like that, I always want to sit with my, with my face facing the entrance. I want to know what's going on. It's, uh, the hate, other way is a more vulnerable being position. being approached from behind like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so then let's say you want to... You want to take the contrarian position to the leader. Let's say you're pitching a meeting or you're trying to convince them of something. The, 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 the position that is contrary to whatever you know their position will be. Um, that person will sit opposite, on the opposite end of, uh, the opposite head of the table. Um, and it, it, it naturally pits them against each other um, in a... Um, Battle of ideas, now, battle of conversation. If it's a dinner and they have placed themselves in the center of a long table so they can interact with both sides, mm. where would you position yourself? Same. I have I have two favorite places. So what if if the the, the head? So we're talking about two different, well, potentially two different things. Yeah. Do you want to influence the head of of the the table, the the leader mm. in the the room, or do you want to mm. do you want to present? That depends Opposing on their, viewpoints. their role and my role. Let's say it's my boss. Yes. Um, I want to be sitting next to my boss in order to help influence how the information is being is being consumed. Yes. If it's like the owner of a company that I'm trying to influence, I'm, I'm across from that person. Yes. I don't That's like being next to the person that I'm trying to influence unless we're on a corner. Right. Yes. I, I, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. There's that, that whole thing, and I guess they say this is true of boys, and ultimately of men, is um, they like to sit next to each other, like on a park bench, and not be you know gazing into each other's eyes ah. so much, um, and that that's something that girls typically don't do. Yes. But I've never been like that because maybe it's just I don't like sitting sideways. But well, I don't know what it is. Part part of it is you're sharing a viewpoint with them. And so this sitting side by side builds camaraderie mm. in, in situations like this. This is not in this book, this is something totally separate. There have been studies done that if the two of us were playing Call of Duty in the same room, that that eventually our heart rates would synchronize and we would start to show similar physiological stresses and, and behaviors as our bodies would, playing, would playing with each other, playing video games with, with each, each other? other in the same room, so against same space. each other, I would want to be like back to back or something. Potentially, yeah. Well, that's good screen looking, but <laughs> um, yeah. So that that's fascinating too. So like, if you're at the table, if you want to to bend the ear of the leader, if you want to influence their decision making, and you're not the one presenting the information, right? You're not trying to convince them. Um, the best place for you to be is to either their immediate right or left. Right here. But the left is actually the most uh, influential position. Something about, and, and again, this is backed by studies, people are more likely to hear good information and accept it when it comes from the immediate left. They're crazy. If you want to be out of sight, let's say it's a, a three on three, three on either side and then one on, on each end. If you want to be out of sight, sit in one of the four further down the end because you're out of the line of sight of the leader and that's a position where you would want to take a a more um, passive approach so if you go into a meeting and you really want to make a name for yourself or you really want to be influential in that particular meeting sit immediately next to to the left of if you can the leader hmm. uh, the head of the table if it's a meeting that maybe it's not about what you you do maybe you're just there to observe 
or you, you kind of want to disappear, sit further away from the leader and, and on one of the edges and you'll kind of... I mean, part begin. of it, if you think about it, if you're sitting at a large table and people are discussing and presenting to the leader, it's as if they're presenting also to you when you're right next to them. Yes. Right? You're hearing the conversations and ideas that are coming this direction. Yep. That's part of the reason why I like it. But you're right. If, if instead I'm in information gathering mode, I'm not influencing, I'm there just to pick something up, then I sit in a completely different position. This is so weird. Well, in, in order to, to influence at that point, you're having to almost lean in to catch the eyesight of the leader down table. Yeah. Right? And, and so you're having to make extra effort to have an influential voice in that, that situation. Mm. Another thing that was that caught my attention is she asked, um, and she's got she's given a really great TED Talk. She's got there are a lot of really good interviews, long videos. TED Talk. Um, What's a TED Talk? TED Talk is an 18 minute long presentation that people can give. It's uh, done all over the world. TED, and TED's an acronym for Technology Education and Development. Maybe I don't know. Did design. Um, probably. TED Talks are, are 18 minute presentations done by professionals, by non-professionals, by people with different interests, and they, they, they get to choose their own topic. They present on it for 18 minutes. They're usually very specific in scope. So they have a, they, they might talk about, about um, some very small piece of what somebody does, or what somebody has researched, or what somebody has, has put together. And they pitch it, and these are regionally done. So there's one in Greensboro. There's one all over. Hers was filmed in London. They then take the best, and they're all filmed. They take the best ones, and then they will kind of filter them down and then put them on their, their almost all of them go onto their, their YouTube channel. But um, the but they'll, stage. They'll put them on the big stage yeah. for the big talks. Um, so one of the things that she, she mentioned in her TED Talk, she said... Um, when you are meeting somebody, when you're making a first impression, where is the first place that you look? Say that again. So I'm, I'm. So if you're meeting somebody, if if you if somebody walks into the room, if somebody walks into the room. Yeah. Um, where on their person do your eyes go first? I want to say their their eyes. Right. Their their face, their eyes. Their face, their eyes. That makes a lot of sense, and that's what most people say. I would think. The reality is, she said, studies back up, that the place we look first is somebody's hands. The thing that we notice first, whether we're looking there intentionally or not, um, the thing that we notice first is their hands. And again, this goes back to prehistoric. This is just, it's a safety mechanism. But what we're looking for is we're looking to see that their hands are open, empty, safe. All right? So, and she demonstrates this very well. She said, if somebody walks into the room and they put their hands behind the back, and they're in the same room as you, and they're not showing you what's in their hands, uh, it doesn't take very long before subconsciously we start to wonder, what are they hiding? Hmm. We become suspicious, and we start worrying and thinking about what's in their hands, what are they doing with their hands, and we stop paying attention to their words. So if you want to be influential, she said, talk with your hands. The other thing is, we communicate with our hands you receive communication with by viewing somebody's hands and how they're talking with their their hand mo movements 12 times more than the words that they say and she said uh so if i said i have some really big news <laughs> right? it's huge you'll never believe it this is communicating that my words are not true <laughs> that is uh, that is incongruent that's right with your words really huge news this communicates more powerfully than even the words really huge news um you know uh, there's I, I i was the uh this the chairman of the speakers bureau for the architectural woodwork institute for about two years and one of the things that we do is we teach people how to speak mm. how to do public speaking there's a pretty good book on giving great presentations and it talked quite a bit about that. They, they say, you know, again, talk about you know, having your hand gestures match the thing you're talking about. One of the things that I picked up from that is if you're talking about length, length of time, distance, things like that, like you say, you're, you're, you're going to want to gesture in certain ways. And if you're talking about a timeline, you would start here and then work your way this direction into the future. 
because you do this as a and presenter the opposite of the way right. I would do if I was talking. From my point of view, it's this way. Right. right. As a presenter, it's but, backwards. But I know it's it's like this. And describing how you're you're getting growth in something, you you start with a with a platform, mm. and then you work your way up and talking about growth. Yeah. And like you say, if it's something that's minuscule, right? Yeah. Use gestures like that. And it, it is interesting how when you see a good presenter, I don't know if they if they practice or if it's just natural, that those kind of talking with your hands is far more engaging than you'll see people that everything that they say is the exact same hand gesture. And, and at some point it starts to get really busy and annoying and it's like, gosh, pull something new out of your bag of tricks, right? Yeah. Pull, yeah. pull, something, pull something new. new. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah she, she talked about how it, with the TED Talks, the top rated TED Talks end up using hand gestures twice as much as the lowest rated. Hmm. Um, the, That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, she talks about smiling and the effect of smiling and how it even has an impact on our voice. True smiling, not fake smiling. Like if you say, yeah, it's great. There's a smile, but it's not genuine. She said genuine smiles pull at these muscles and cause crow's feet. And so you should be looking for that if you're trying to, to gauge somebody's true, um, how they truly feel. But it's one of those things that you can kind of fake, that your facial expressions are tied to your emotions in such a way that if you really smile, if you really have these expressions, you will start to feel those behaviors. She said if you scowl, if you if you if you frown or like fear uh this was a good example she said fear what happens when you express fear and and one thing that's interesting about these expressions is these are these are physiological expressions they're not cultural and they're not um learned so for a long time psychologists sociologists thought expressions were learned then they discovered that babies who were born blind were developing smiles and were developing mm fear facial uh, expressions at the same rate as children that could see. Wow. And so they discovered that it's something that's ingrained. So for fear, you raise your eyebrows and you breathe in. You go, and if you do that, do that. There's a physiological response where you start yeah. to feel a little bit anxious. Just it, it, You feel it I, down here. I realize that, I need to go to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's interesting. Uh, another one, practical, maybe a bit more practical, um, they did this study on uh, questions that you ask people when you first meet somebody. Uh, so they asked these seven questions, and then they, and, and they did a speed dating roundtable where they would have people ask, a, ask the, a question and then have a conversation based off of these, these questions. So different people were given questions to ask, is that what so, you're So basically, imagine speed dating and every round you would start the conversation, as you move people, you'd start the conversation with a different question. Okay. Okay. And, um, and, and they would do it over and over and over again and then at the end they would rank from one to five, was the conversation that followed boring or stellar, one to five, right? So the questions are, what's your story? How are you? What was the highlight of your day? What do you do? Have anything, has anything exciting, oh, do you have anything exciting coming up in your life? What brings you here? And what personal passion projects are you working on? Mm. So of those questions, if you rank them in order of the kind of conversation that follows, the very best ones in order, what was the highlight of your day? Right. What, what personal passion projects are you working right. on? Right. What do you have upcoming? Anything exciting upcoming? What's your story? What brings you here? What do you do? And the last one is how are you? So huh. when you meet somebody, the, one of the very worst things you can ask is, so what do you do? Because the conversation yeah. says, what do you do? Oh, really? That's interesting. And where are you from? Oh, great. I'm going to go get a drink now. <laughs> right? And the conversation's just over. It doesn't go anywhere. You ask somebody, um, you know, what was the highlight of your day? They're going to find a highlight to tell you and they're going to prompt continued questions and and so i highly recommend it i literally have only read 30 minutes of this book and, and listened to a TED few talk? podcasts i watched the ted talk during my lunch break and, and was watching some other stuff it's very compelling um you know everything from how to talk and smile sitting up you know posture very practical things 
One of the ones that I glossed over and so don't know enough about to tell you, but they t she talks about if you're at a party, if you're at a reception, if you're at a place where there's um, a bar and tables for food, it actually shows scientifically the best place to talk, to have a conversation, to, to stand, to have a conversation with somebody. You know, and so if you meet somebody at the door where you're coming in, their natural instinct is to continue to scan around right. you to see who else is there. So they better, better if you meet them at the food, this is a problem. If you meet them here, it's a problem. You want to talk to them here at this point in time because they've had enough time to scan the room, had enough time to do this and that. And so stuff like that for social settings, if you are a person who finds yourself in a social setting, uh, with what little I have already learned, I highly recommend the book. Yeah, I was recently kind of binge watching. Whatever it's called, it'll be a link in the description. I was binge watching the uh, comedians in cars drinking coffee. Captivate, captivate. Is the book okay? Sorry, comedians in cars drinking yes. coffee, which is the Jerry Seinfeld. Wonderful. They're on YouTube. I'm sorry, on uh, Netflix. Highly recommend them. In, in part because of the way he's interviewing. He picks people up in a car, a car that was chosen just for them, and about half of the conversation is them behind the wheel, Jerry driving them in the passenger seat, and then they wind up at a diner or someplace where they can sit and chat. And the interviews that he has done with people that don't normally open up and who are not usually themselves are very good. I don't recommend watching the one with... Um, Jim Carrey, not a good example, hmm. but uh, some, some of the ones that were, were really good is uh, some of the folks that have been on Seinfeld, for example, because they had common the rapport, experiences yeah. they could talk about. And I, I believe that it was the one where he was interviewing uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus, mm -hmm. Louis Dreyfus, Louis Dreyfus yeah. uh, Elaine from Seinfeld. She was saying how uncomfortable she is with small talk. Mm. and at parties, and he kind of gave her a hint. He says, I ask questions about numbers. So how long have you lived here? How many children do you have? Um, you know, how many cars, how many homes? Things that, that people can answer the question, feel like they've engaged with you, but you're yeah. not going to go down any deep, huh. you know, I'm not going to become their best friend yeah. kind of thing, which I thought was interesting and very shallow. Yes, that's almost an opposite approach. That's to yes. keep it from becoming yes. deep. Yes, isn't huh. that weird? Uh, but again, for folks, that have, for folks that have trouble getting conversations going, yeah. that's not a bad thing because we have those things in common with one another. Well, and those people get so inundated with requests for conversation that they just don't want to have those well, conversations. And, and I think that that's also why the, the conversations that he's having are so good is because many of these people are, are on a tour promoting a book or a movie mm. or a TV show, and they've been asked the same question over and over and over again, and he's not asking those questions. Right. Um, you know, he's he's asking them questions that have to do with their career choices and, and their dreams and things. I, I'm also now, uh, uh, I work for the HR department in my company. I was working for the director of sales, and it's kind of an interesting thing. Some companies' yeah. training departments are associated with HR. My role hasn't changed with the exception that I'm now involved in inventory, in, in interviewing potential employees. Oh, cool. And my interview style and questions are so different than anybody else because if we hire this person, I'm going to be spending a lot of time with them in their first year, year and a half yeah. involved in training. So I want to know about them, the real <laughs> them. So I don't... I, I, I tend to glance at their resume, yeah. but I know that those are so well formulated that, that what I want to know isn't even there. And I want to know things about how, like, have you ever had a business? Or, you know, tell me a little bit about, I don't ask it as a closed question, tell me about a situation where, where maybe you either started a company or maybe were the principal in a, in a company. Yeah, and uh, and then also if there's none, well, if you could could start a business, let's say I wave a magic wand and suddenly you have all the wherewithal and you could start your own business, what would it be? And uh, those conversations are pretty usually pretty great. It also helps to identify misfits because um, there will be people that'll say, oh, well, what I really like to do is is this because it's online. I don't have to interact with people. We're interviewing them for a sales <laughs> job. You're right. Right? And, and yeah. really, it, people have revealed very important personality traits because 
I took a different tack. Yeah, um, uh, our our president got this idea. I don't know where he got it, but they, they sometimes for interviews, the interview process could be quite lengthy. And the very first initial interview is, is he'll meet somebody for coffee and won't really, he'll just ask about your life, about, you know, your history. Well, why did you make this choice? And really, really digging very deep before asking any sort of typical interview question. And that comes at the very, very end. And the idea is he's digging for a nugget of truth. And the idea is you, you want to, he's, he's trying to get the person so comfortable mm -hmm. that they'll reveal who they truly are. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it can throw you off guard. I got in trouble uh, interviewing somebody recently because I was asking, I asked, um, I'll look at their resume and find something that's interesting and ask deep questions about that. You know, tell me more about that. Oh, really? You did it like this way? Why this way? Um, but then uh, we'll also ask uh, Desert Island, you know, if you could watch three, three movies for the rest of your life, what would they be? Yeah. And we were laughing about it, um, and, and someone got on my case for not uh, taking the interview process seriously enough. I'm taking it very seriously, but there needs to be some rapport, I think, hmm. um, built at a certain point. First, and, and the first thing I tell people, which absolutely puts people at ease, is the fact that, look, this is, this is new to me. I'm new to the HR yeah. department. It's not my normal gig. I'm just kind of filling in. And so let's just take the pressure off of this. I'm as uncomfortable right now as you are. And they'll laugh and usually, you know, know. the tie gets loosened or whatever. Yeah. Um, it, and I've done it on the phone. I've done it in person and had some really, really good conversations. I eliminated some people. Sure. And it, But more importantly, the folks that we ultimately then hire, I have a connection with them that I never had before. Yes. So it's kind of, hey. Yeah, it's nice. Welcome. I'm so glad to see you here, and uh, you know, let's get let's get going on your uh, your new career, get you successful. I heard today somebody say that that instead of asking, "Tell me about your weaknesses," yeah. they they ask their last question is, "Why shouldn't I hire you?" Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's not a question I would want to have to answer. So I, I've had two really interesting interview experiences. The first one was. Um, interviewed with a sales manager and you know kind of got the lay of the the land that was several people being interviewed at one time we were all in a boardroom together and uh, at one point they pulled us individually out of the room and we met with their IT guy who had a computer thing that he was uh, gonna be running personality test or something like that and as I sat down to talk to and this hey this is Brent and um, he was having trouble getting the thing going and had to reboot his computer and blah, blah, blah. And, and so we just had a casual conversation. And then finally he got the thing up and running. He asked two or three questions and we were good. Turns out he was the owner of the company. Yeah, it's part of the interview process. Yeah, right. Brent. Yeah, Brent. yeah. <laughs> um, the other one, and it, it actually may have even been that same interview process, they asked everybody in the room to write down on a piece of paper if they had hiring ability in that company, what one other person in the room mm. would they recommend we hire? And we had spent time communicating with That's each other, question. and uh, we were able to identify. Yeah, it's a really good those question. Folks. I got hired, so nice. I, I spoke well to Brent. Yeah, I didn't waste that time when the computer wasn't working. Just had a conversation. If I had known he was the owner, I probably would have asked more questions myself. Yeah, but it, it was a very casual, loose conversation, and he got to know me. I've heard of companies doing that where the receptionist in the front is actually the owner's <laughs> wife. Wow. You know, and the, the, but it's it, she's a plant on purpose to see how they treat, how the employee treats um, I was little at, people. I was at a business recently where the owner's wife was working the front desk and she recently had had brain surgery. And uh, even though I'd met her a couple times before, she had no idea who I was and, and explained to me that she has had this brain surgery and apologized for that, and uh, I wouldn't say she was a plant, but she wasn't far off. All right, <laughs> on yeah. that note, okay. <laughs> wow, deeply offensive comment. Wow. So let's we're gonna put a couple uh, a couple notes below. I want to link to maybe a couple of our favorite TED talks. Sure. I recommend I I listen to the TED podcast, but I do prefer to watch them. Yeah. And there are ones that I've listened to that I was so inspired I went and watched them. Another one is the, is the moth. Moth is another uh, storytelling. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that one you typically don't need to see them. Yeah. Um, but they're both on YouTube. I think the Moth Talks are on YouTube. So if you're going to get into public speaking or just want to get better at talking to people, I, I'd recommend checking these out. Check out the book. I'll put the book I recommend, the one on giving great presentations. And, uh, and and if you're like us at all, once you see one that clicks, you'll go down the rabbit hole of all of their presentations that they've done everywhere. That's true. Um, that happens often. That's true. Uh, this was a far superior way to smoke this. Uh, but I'm just tired of smoking it, cigars it, right Me now. as well. Yeah. Me as well. Much, much better. And But I'd had that experience before, and I knew that it would be better. And uh, so if you're in that situation where you got a dried-out cigar, smoke it in a pipe. I think that because, again, I'm not normally a cigar smoker, I probably would have enjoyed that blended in with some other tobacco. Right. So. Well, maybe uh, experiment for another, another time. Sounds good. All right, thanks for your time. Make it a great week. See ya. Talk to you again soon.